This is your host, Corbin, and this is your guide for Rennie Harlan's Die Hard 2. Before we get into the making of the film, allow me to take you back to 1990 to remember the top movies released that year. They were Goodfellas, Home Alone, The Rescuers Down Under, Edward Scissorhands, Misery, Pretty Woman, The Godfather Part 3, Total Recall, Dances with Wolves, Tremors, Predator 2, Gremlins 2, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, It, The Hunt for Red October, Ghost, and my personal favorite of the franchise, that is, Child's Play 2. From that year, we have reviewed Back to the Future Part 3 and Jacob's Ladder. Links to those reviews are in the show notes below. If you would like to reminisce more about the films of 1990, then head over to letterbox.com and make sure to follow me and Alan over there. Links to our profiles are below. At the 62nd Academy Awards, Best Picture went to Driving Miss Daisy. Like last time, Die Hard 2 is based on a book. Unlike last time, it is not an adaption of a Roderick Thorpe novel. Instead, this time it was taken from Walter Wagger's 1987 novel, 58 Minutes. While the plots are similar, the main differences are the airport itself is taken hostage, not the runway, and the police officer only has 58 minutes to save his daughter on the plane, not his wife who has a much longer time frame in the film. The villains of the film are ripped straight from the headlines by screenwriter Stephen E. D'Souza, who is returning from the last movie. He based them on figures in the Iran-Contra affair. One of the major sub-villains, Franco Nero, who played General Esperanza, didn't like the script and was ultimately berated into briefly starring in the film by returning producer Joel Silver. This is according to an interview by Baron de Vogt with Franco Nero in the Dutch fanzine Chocant News. As I noted, Rennie Harlan came on board to direct, his previous film being A Nightmare in Elm Street 4, The Dream Master. John McTiernan didn't return for Die Hard 2 because he had moved on to the first Jack Ryan slash Tom Clancy big screen adaption, The Hunt for Red October. Shooting at the Denver airport was scrapped because it was too warm to convincingly depict the blizzard conditions. Therefore, they moved production to Michigan and an indoor Los Angeles soundstage, hence a lot of the fake snow in the movie. As for the visual effects, ILM painted the first digital matte painting for the movie. The film also contained extensive blue screen compositing for a sequence in which Bruce Willis is ejected out of a plane's cockpit. At the time, this was some pretty groundbreaking steps in the visual effect world. Die Hard 2 was originally slated to release June 29th, but was pushed back to open on July 4th. So you're probably wondering, how did it do opening weekend? Well, it was number one at the box office, which is a step up considering the original Die Hard film was number three opening weekend. So audiences were very much primed to see this. The first film, only $7 million this time around. It grossed three times that $21.7 million opening weekend. And audiences really didn't have to wait long. It was one year, 11 months, and 14 days. So audiences had to wait just under two years to get to see the sequel. So what did it go up against opening weekend? Well, Days of Thunder, that is a Tom Cruise, Ron Howard film that isn't great. It's not very memorable. I have seen it. That came in at number two. It Die Hard 2 dethroned Days of Thunder, knocked it down to number two. Dick Tracy came in at number three. Premiering that same weekend, Jetsons the Movie came in at number four with only $5 million. Uh, from Universal Pictures, and rounding out the top five was Total Recall. Another reason Die Hard beat Jetsons the movie at the theaters was Jetsons was a really old cartoon, seems really strange to release it in 1990, and also it opened in 1,000 more theaters than the Jetsons did. Die Hard 2 did remain um, number one at the box office two weeks in a row, going up against the Patrick Swayze, Demi Moore film Ghost, which also opened um, in the second week. Uh, the Jungle Book, believe it or not, was re-released in 1990, coming in at number four. And The Adventures of Ford Fairlane came in at number five. This is kind of odd to note, listeners, because that film was also directed by Rennie Harlan. So two Rennie Harlan films were released a week apart and were competing with each other. And they were both 20th Century Fox films. So I have... No clue in the world why 20th Century Fox wanted to cannibalize itself, but nevertheless, they did. 
And as you can see, Ford Fairlane did pretty bad at the box office. And um, nobody remembers that movie, honestly, it seems like. If you remember it, listener, shoot me an email. I'm curious. So how did the second film fare with critics and audiences? Well, quite well, actually. A uh, letterbox rating of 3.3, an IMDb rating of 7.1. That's still a pretty big drop from the 8.2, but not bad. A 67 meta score. It is definitely in the green. 69% critics rating on Rotten Tomatoes. So a majority of critics liked it. Very much down from the 94% certified fresh last time, though. 70% audience rating and an A cinema score. So audience straight out of the theater thought it was just a notch below the first film. So across the board, these are positive scores. They are in the green, but you can see they are major drops from the last time. But a major uptick was the budget. Um, first film, $28 million. This time, $70 million budget. Um, it also released in about 800 more theaters than last time. So at the domestic box office, it would go under gross $117.5 million. A decent upswing from the first one. Nothing crazy, though. In the foreign markets, it did far better. $122.4 million, up from $57.7 million last time for a worldwide total of $240 million. This film grossed $100 million more than the last film. Grossing a quarter of a billion dollars is very impressive for a sequel. So this put this film over the $400 billion mark, making this duology already a half a billion dollar franchise. Very impressive. Um, it did not return to the Academy Awards. Spoiler alert, listeners, this franchise has never returned to the Academy Awards since the very first film. Thank you, listeners, for coming along with me as I've been your guide to the production and impact of this film. Now that you have your guide to Die Hard 2, make sure to subscribe to the podcast for my full review coming next Monday. And tune in the week after as Alan and I catch some waves for his birthday. The Silver Screen Guide podcast is edited and produced by Alan and Corbin. Intro and outro music is created by Thomas Rankin. The thoughts and opinions herein expressed are those of the individual and do not necessarily represent those held by Silver Screen Guide. Silver Screen Guide is not affiliated with any company or individual involved with the creation of this movie or TV show. No portion of the podcast may be used without express written permission from Silver Screen Guide.